Thank you, Tim. I'd like to acknowledge, begin to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am on today, the Wadawurrung people who are part of the Kulon Nation, who have taken such great care of this beautiful land that I live in. I would also like to pay my respects to the elders past and present and emerging in the lands of Australia and the Torres Strait Islanders. And I pay my respects to your elders past and present wherever you are in the world. So today, very briefly, uh, what, uh, what today is going to be about is Tim is going to share his, his journey, his st story, his experience, his powerful experience with both flood and fire. And then we'll be inviting our co-creators, David, Sally and, and Betsy to respond to Tim's story. And then we'll provide an invitation for each and every one of you to explore the story in the three spaces that we've created with David, Sally and Betsy. So David will be exploring in his space, liminal spaces. So there's an invitation to go into David's breakout room to explore that. And then with Sally, it's, ex it's examining climate consciousness and having a, co a conversation. And Betsy will be inviting discomfort and impactful communication in her space. And then we'll come back together to unpack what, what was learned, what was experienced, what's important here. So I'm going to now invite each of our wonderful co-creators to introduce themselves very briefly. So first of all, I'd like to hand over to Betsy. Betsy, if you'd like to share very briefly with the, the people here who you are. All right, well, my name is Betsy Reed, which you can see from my title. I was born and raised in Wyoming, which is land of Arapaho and Shoshone tribes. And I then made my way all over the place. I spent 15 years almost in the UK and became an adopted Scot. And now I live in Barcelona, Spain. But my entire focus for all of my career has been on social and environmental issues. So I now call myself, because there are so many things I could call myself, probably as with many of you, a leadership mentor and sustainability expert. And I've written a book, but I'm also a yoga and meditation teacher and I teach yin yoga. And that has helped me to sort of market, test, and hone my obsession with discomfort and the productive value of discomfort in conversations, in how we live, in how we actually have a positive impact on the world around us. So that is going to form a lot of the focus in my breakout room today, which obviously will be co-created with those of you who choose to be there. And I also host a podcast called The Discomfort Practice. And Tim is, in fact, my next guest. So you'll uh, definitely want to catch that episode coming out mm. next Sunday. It's a little you know, shout out to Tim there, but I'm really happy to be here today. So it's great to see all of you here. Welcome, Betsy. And, and thank you for being here so late as well, over where you are. So we appreciate you being here. And so Sally, I'd love you to introduce yourself to the group, please. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Sally Gillespie, and I'm honoured to be here today. And not many people get me up at 4.30 in the morning, but <laughs> Tim and the Climate Coaching Alliance are definitely those people. And um, so I'm very happy to be here today. I hail from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and now live on Gadigal and Wangal country in Sydney, Australia. I once was a psychotherapist, a Jungian psychotherapist, but the pool to, to come into the greater world out, out of the clinical room became too much. I did a PhD on the psychological experience of ongoing climate engagement and wrote a book called Climate Crisis and Consciousness. And I don't really know what to call myself these days, except mm. um, uh, mm. someone who is very much committed to working in community um, with others to meet the a crisis we're in and yeah CCA is one of my favorite communities. Thank you Sally and I, I resonate with what you shared about getting up at 4 30 a.m in the morning I'm actually you heard that I'm from the Wadawurrung country but I'm also south of Melbourne in Point Lonsdale Australia so thank you Sally for sharing that and of course uh, likewise very very pleased to be here and also to be here with David Drake. And David, if you could also introduce yourself. Thank you. I'd be happy to. So I live in Portland, Oregon in the Pacific Northwest of the US. Um, I'm most known as the founder of Narrative Coaching. I've been teaching that work for 
20 years. Um, and we've now started a new body of work called Integrative Development, which takes the learning and development theory in narrative coaching and makes it scalable to any time, any place. Um, and a lot of that for me, going back to what you were saying, Betsy, a lot of the work I do, I, I wanna pay homage to my family for its dysfunction. I'm not sure I would have created my work if I had a healthier family. Uh, but one of the things that I just observed from early in life that was very challenging for them was to uh, speak truthfully for themselves and particularly around issues like grief or, um, and so I just made a promise when I was quite young that I, when I grew up, I was going to dedicate my life to help people have the conversations they otherwise might not have, but are yearning to have. Um, and so the work really now is uh, we're doing some pilots in schools and a couple of universities to begin to reimagine education and to liberate people to, um, to learn uh, more quickly. And my topic around liminality comes from the narrative coaching work about life in between. And it's a space that's often quite unknown and many people avoid and we're in this grand unknown in, the Ukra in Ukraine and in a lot of places in our life at the moment, like what, what is gonna happen and where do I, how do I stand in this? How do I act in this? Who am I in this? Um, and my goal in life is to uh, transcend every silo I can and just be David. Mm. Beautiful, David. And uh, again, I really appreciate what you share and uh, we are in interesting times. And so finding that narrative is, is really important. That voice to be able to speak up in all sorts of areas and, and places and discomfort, which I'm hearing Betsy and Sally are also um, wanting to be able to create that space too. So before I hand over to Tim, what I would like to share is that we are recording this but there is an opportunity, as you heard, to go into the breakout rooms, which won't be recorded, those breakout rooms. But Tim and I will be here in the main room if you want to stay here. So we will continue to record in the main breakout room if there are more than just Tim and I in the main breakout room. So um, uh, we just want to let you know that that is what will be happening. So in the breakout rooms, it will be a safe place to, to be able to have a voice and share. So I'd love to now hand over to Tim to introduce his story and uh, share his story. So once, we, once Tim has completed, um, each of the co-creators will be responding to that. And you may have some questions for Tim, but if you can hold those questions until we all come back from the breakout rooms and then there'll be an opportunity to ask questions and share. So. So Tim, my wonderful colleague and friend, over to you to share. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. Um, would you like to introduce yourself in 30 seconds or less since you've omitted to do so thus far? <laughs> I can do that very quickly. So um, my name is Janine Bailey. I am uh, again based here in Australia. Uh, I have a a business where I train people to become coaches, professional coaches, which originally started in the Middle East, but now is global with the pandemic. So, and I guess like others here in this space, it's all about supporting people to have a voice and to be able to really understand who they are at their core, their authentic self. And again, to appreciate perhaps why they're here on this planet right here, right now. Um, and again, to be able to step into their purpose and their values. Uh, I too um, have been attracted to this wonderful place community, which is the Climate Coaching Alliance, founded by Josie McLean, Eve Turner, uh, and the wonderful Alison Wybrow, who we lost recently. Uh, I am so, yeah, again, privileged and grateful to be in this space. It's um, such an important space. And and of course, I'm also pleased to be have this wonderful connection with Tim, uh, and we're doing some some great work in the climate space yet to be yet to unfold. So delighted to be here. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, thank you. Okay, everybody. Um, a couple of um, invitations as. I prepare um, to share 
my journey with you and a story that I hold, although I do not consider it to be mine. I consider this to be the story of many people, particularly those that shared the experiences that I will narrate. But in this time, um, and particularly exactly at this time, um, and in places not very far from here, um, we are witnessing events and people are experiencing events comparable to some that I'll be describing. So I consider this to be a collective story, um, one that I hold, one of which there are many versions and many versions that have been lived, are being created right now and will, um, will be experienced. Some of um, what I'm going to share, um, you may find emotionally stimulating. Uh, if you have had any experiences um, of grief recently, um, some of the elements of this story may be triggering for you. Um, and if you're in any anxious state um, as a result of your awareness of what is happening in our world and with our climate, then some of the experiences I describe may be triggering. Um, so an invitation, if you find any of those um, emotions being stirred, um, is to sigh out loud, big bodily sigh, oh, which you may find will be a benefit in um, perhaps calming those emotions momentarily. Um, please do stay on the call uh, if you're happy and comfortable to do so, but do not feel obliged to stay. Um, but there will be space um, to ask questions, to respond, uh, and to be together um, in, in the main room here and in the three breakout spaces. Um, so, yeah, there we go. So with your blessing, I will begin um, sharing the journey that I am on. And this portion of it begins many years ago when, as a younger man, I traveled to an unknown faraway land in search of adventure. And I found myself in the desert being guided by two indigenous men. And the three of us spent days wandering between local villages, um, meeting people that they knew, uh, who always welcomed me with an open heart um, and an expansive mind. And it was the adventure that I sought. What shifted through the third day was very unexpected in the desert in that it started to rain. Um, not particularly dramatic rain to someone who grew up in the UK, um, but to my companions who were similar in age to me in their mid-twenties, they were really excited, almost childlike, um, and explained that they had never seen rain like this in their entire lives. And we changed our plans and, and we moved to make shelter uh, with one of the families that these two knew. Um, and the headman there was in a sim similar age to where I, st I stand now, he was in his mid forties and he had seen rain once like this before as a child. And we spent some time sheltering uh, and then made the decision to take um, the ch our chances with simply getting wet. Um, and in a break in the rain, we headed back to our vehicle. We hiked hard and we got back to the vehicle just in time to shelter from a hailstorm, um, which smashed our windshield um, significantly damaged the body of the vehicle and we were forced to proceed at really a snail's pace. And the beauty of the desert that we had seen on our way through as the soft, dusty, light cover of the dunes was eroded to reveal this magnificent vista, marble-like uh, expanse of wave and colour. As we sat in the vehicle with the 
a hail damage vehicle um, with darkness descending around us, the contrast between that vista and what lay ahead of us could not have been more dramatic as we arrived shortly after nightfall in time to witness the very dramatic extent, the darkness and despair of a community that was being devastated by a flash flood. We crested the hill that formed part of the community and in our headlights and the headlights of other vehicles looked down into the, what had been the main street of this bustling tourist town to find complete chaos. There was no early warning system in this part of the world. The water had arrived as a turgid wave, catching people unawares as they were sitting with their families, having their evening meals, as they were putting their children to bed. By the time we arrived, many people had scrambled onto the roofs of their homes and the few people who were close enough to the higher ground, either to be on that high ground or to have been rescued by those who were able to reach them. But by the time we arrived, everybody else was basically where they would remain. And the image which is so most viscerally seared into my brain is watching a family of three generations sitting on the roof of their home about 30 meters away from where we were sitting quite calmly and over what i would estimate to be around 20 30 minutes that we watched they didn't cry out for help they didn't panic they just sat there whilst the water surged around them and rose and eroded the walls of their home and they disappeared never to be seen again. The three of us, three fit, active men could do nothing as could any of the other villagers around us. And as a trained lifeguard who's made rescues in open and protected water, I've never felt so impotent as I did. And with my companions spent the night curled up in a fetal position on the dented bonnet of a land cruiser, completely and utterly useless. The next morning, the surging waters had faded to a calm mill pond like expanse of water and we waded across that to reach the rise on the other side of town where my guides families they hoped were still there and okay as they were. And we didn't know what we would find the trepidation of each footfall one in front of the other but nothing was found, nothing to be salvaged, no one to be rescued. And as my guides headed off up the hill to find their families, I stayed looking out over the waters and found myself sitting alone in the company of an old man. And in a shared second language, he inquired to, as to my well-being and about what I thought of what we had both seen the previous night and after a few minutes of conversation he stood up and beckoned me to follow him and he walked a short distance and opened the door to a building and went inside beckoning me to follow him which i did and as i arrived at the doorway of the building i realized that it was a shop that it was seemingly his business an antiques business and i confess that my first reaction was one of discussed that this was no time to be buying trinkets and souvenirs and as the word i started to form the words to say i can't buy anything i've given all the money that i have away already he put his hand up to quiet me and he said you're not here to buy anything you're here so that you can receive something and he picked this up and he extended his arm for me to take and he said I want you to have this and I want you to wear it and as you do I want you to remember what you've seen 
so that you'll know what to do. And he closed the door and I never saw him again. So what did I do? After everything that I had seen, what changed in me? And I'm, confess I'm ashamed to say that what changed was not very much and what I did was nothing. I got on a bus, I got on a plane, I went back to the country where I lived and I did nothing. I watched people die right in front of me. I did nothing. Many years later, I <clears throat> was crouched on the roof of this building with a pink plastic drip hose in my hands, trying to thread it along the ridge line and protect our home from the raging front of the Karawan bushfire, which was one of many fires that was devastating lives, communities, and ecologies through Australia in the 2020 black fires. And we had been preparing our property for days. I was exhausted. This was the last thing I had to do before we fled for the second time in three days on a mandatory evacuation. And something caused me to stand up. And as I stood, my consciousness shifted and I moved into a different place. And I had a vision. The vision that I saw, I physically turned 240 degrees. But all that I got from a sensory perspective was what I saw. There was no feeling on my skin. There was no raging wind. I could not hear the devastating sound of an impending bushfire. But what I saw was everything on fire. Cars in the driveway, the front lawn, the backyard, the neighbors' homes, everything was on fire, in fact, apart from the building that I stood on. And as this vision flowed for several minutes, I received a message. No voice, nobody spoke to me. But I received a message with absolute clarity, which was, from what is coming, there is nowhere to hide. All you can do is all you can do with all that you are. And this changed me. I got down off the roof and from the moment I hit my feet hit the ground, I was a changed being. I did not know what to do. And I did not recognize all that I was immediately, but over the days and weeks and months that followed, what was revealed to me was a retrospective path that I had been on for a long time. The vision of the flood, that experience was rediscovered, having disassociated myself fully from it since it occur its occurrence. One of the first things I did after I got off the roof was go and get this out of a little box and I kept it in pretty much since I'd returned home after it was given to me. And my first realization was that the shift I had made was in to witnessing, a shift from wandering to actively witnessing the life that I was living and the journey that I was on. And that that process of self-observation and reflection and reconnecting more firmly with values, bringing my locus of control internally, that that was an active process of witnessing myself as I had once been and shifting from my wandering led simply by whatever was cool or trending or that I was told was important. And where I believe I find myself now is in a cycle between active witnessing and wayfinding. Wayfinding being the conscious act of navigating an unknown space and choosing the direction to go. 
and perhaps enabling others to do the same. Beyond wayfinding, I believe there are a number of choices that we can make and other cycles that we can enter into. Um, but I won't speak more about those now. Um, some of what you're thinking and feeling and might be co-created in the breakout spaces may indicate where you're at on this journey, whether these terms and frames do anything for you and what you might believe exists beyond witnessing and wayfinding. But thank you for being here. Thank you for your time and attention. I invite us now to just hold a minute silence of reflection. And then Janine will break that silence for us and invite our co-creators to give the first response. Thank you, Tim, for that very powerful, very powerful story, which brought up a lot of emotions. I can feel my body still recovering from what you shared. So I'd like to invite our co-creators to respond to your story very briefly before we go into the breakout rooms. And so I invite you, David, to Mm. Firstly, share your response. Thank you. Mm. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so I just uh, noticed three things, three moments in your story, Tim, the standing there with the 30 meter gap that in between you and the people that you could not help and that emotion. I thought of you standing there in the shop holding the gifts in your hand that you were given. And then I thought of the moment of you standing on your own roof and so these, my keen interest in liminality is around these moments when we recognize the in-between. And sometimes we step into them and sometimes we don't. And how do we hold space for ourselves with kindness to be there, however we are, but to really recognize what those moments are, they're portals into another way of being in the world. And um, so I just really appreciate seeing your movement through that. And so... Thank you, Tim. And Sally, I invite you next. Thank you, Janine. Yes, this is such a powerful story. I've heard it a number of times and each telling really moves me, particularly sitting here listening to flooding rain. And Tim's story does speak to us about meeting the ongoing catastrophes of climate upheaval and the necessity of making a relationship with this as our reality in this time. And it can stir apocalyptic imaginings, imaginings and narratives, which without a sense of sufficient community or resources can lead to feelings of paralysis. Um, but Tim's experience and his telling of the story also speaks of resources, connecting to resources, time, as well as the experience of catastrophe. And we have long collective resources of navigating catastrophe over human history through plagues and famines, earthquakes and floods. And I'm always particularly moved when I hear this story about the message from the village elder to Tim of you will know what to do. Mm. And indeed, though Tim went away with a, a story about his failure in this flood, I believe it, was seeded at that time, that sense of knowing what to do and being pulled, as you said, David, into that portal when the time arrived. Um, and the elder holds that longer view. It does take us time sometimes to be ready. And, you know, this word apocalypse comes from the Greek meaning the tearing away of the veil. And catastrophes etymology takes us to a phrase which means to turn downwards. And both suggest that catastrophe might become a rite of passage, as you talked about, David, a portal. When we can accept the reality of climate crisis, this veil is torn away and we head downwards to where there are deeper resources, knowing and commitment, and where we are all joined together. 
So knowing what to do may not seem at first to be more than having a conversation or attending a meeting or joining a group, but they're all steps into a, a new world where our old priorities and values fall away, as Tim described. Um, the unconscious leads us in these times of crisis with wisdom and protection. And often there is a way forward that opens that we cannot fully understand, but can feel uh, as we move our story in life and our engagement with this world. I had a similar experience of an apocalyptic vision as my rite of passage into my commitment to, to lifelong action on climate. And so I know this experience of how facing into climate catastrophe can bring an utter reorientation of life and self and with it, a calling to action and a discovery of inner resources, which can only be revealed once the veil is dropped and we ourselves have dropped to earth. And yeah, this is what I will be exploring through uh, opening conversations uh, in the breakout. Thank you, Sally. Beautiful. And over to you, Betsy. That's a tough act to follow, Sally. <laughs> the thing that there were three things that really stood out to me, um, which was it, it is about time that it's only in the following the path that it's revealed to you. Often, Tim, you said something about how your path was revealed retrospectively and that you also realized that you had nowhere to hide. And, and the question was, what do you do? And what came out of that for me was very much about who you are and that the doing comes from being, from really truly connecting to what's important to you. And often that's only revealed through discomfort and Sally said, catastrophe. It is a rite of passage and that being with that discomfort in those liminal spaces, I'm definitely with my people here, is mm -hmm. the thing that reveals where you're meant to be and who you truly are. And, and you know, so many people exist without ever getting to that level of discomfort and truth about themselves and the world and what they need to be in it. But it brought you to this beautiful place of, as you said, active witnessing and wayfinding. And that, that was a portal, the way being in the birth canal is a portal to life on this earth. It's uncomfortable, it's scary, it's painful. Nobody knows how it's gonna go, but it's absolutely necessary to enter this life that you're meant to be in. So that's what struck me. It was, it was very much you being birthed into who you needed to be and who you are now. So thank you so much for sharing that. It's the second time I've heard that story and it really hits. Mm. Thank you, Betsy. Um, and I, I loved what each and every one of you shared. And it's interesting how I've just come back from, from Brisbane, uh, from a holiday. And I landed in Brisbane the day of, that the flood started. Mm. And so I witnessed four days of rain straight where it did not stop, did not stop. It was incredible. And so again, I resonate with what you were sharing, Tim, rains that we've never seen before. And so I was in an area that where I wasn't impacted directly, but certainly I could walk to the places that had been impacted by the recent floods. So um, it still is, I guess, a little bit raw, even though, again, I have not been impacted directly. Um, but again, I thank you for sharing this story, Tim, because I do believe it, it again reminds and reconnects us to who we are and, and potentially our purpose. And I've, as a coach, um, with the bushfires that impacted Australia a couple of years ago. Again, I, I guess I can resonate to what Tim was sharing. I felt helpless. Um, I could see this devastation going on around me, even though it didn't impact me directly, but I just felt helpless and hopeless. Um, and then I discovered the CCA. The CCA, came at such a timely, the Climate Coaching Alliance came at such a timely time um, that I found this beautiful community to rebirth, reconnect, understand what's important to me, which has led to this connection, which has led to me being involved in climate action where I live, 
um, and so much more. So thank you, Tim, for bringing that story to life. And so now we'd like to open up the rooms with our three um, amazing co-creators, David, Betsy and Sally. And so there is a choice for everyone here to opt into these rooms. So you've heard a little bit about what each of them are going to be sharing uh, or exploring. So David in liminal spaces, Sally climate co consciousness and conversation around that and Betsy uh, who is inviting a space of discomfort and impactful communication. So I believe you'll have about maybe 15 minutes in the breakout rooms, and then we'll come back together to unpack and close out what we've been learning. So uh, I'm going to hand over to Tim now, who's set up the breakout rooms, I believe, and perhaps can share how people can join those places. Yeah, the three rooms are now open. Um, so <clears throat> this is a choice-based participative experience that, that together the um, six of us in actual fact have, um, have designed. Uh, we had uh, the very brilliant Claire Marshall due to be joining us today, but she is in a flood impacted part of Northern New South Wales. She is fine, her home is on a hill, but there's no internet connection. So unfortunately, her experiential futures element uh, were not available, available to share today, but we will we'll hope to reconvene with, with Claire. Her, her work is significant and informative in this space. Uh, if there's anything that you would like to ask me or Janine, um, you're welcome to stay here um, and you can jump into the breakout rooms at any time. But a, an invitation um, to you, um, it's really early in the morning and I don't have anywhere else to go directly after this session. So if, if, you would, if you're holding a question for me, I would encourage you to go into one of the breakout rooms, whichever one calls you, and then you can express your question uh, if you have time after the hour session that we have booked here. Um, but if you need to go on the hour and you have a question, then please stay here and feel welcome to unmute and express it or if you'd rather not vocalize then um, feel free to put something in the chat and uh, Janine or I can respond to it directly but the the rooms are open and underway so feel free to go wherever you feel most you'd like to be. Welcome welcome back everybody and we trust as you all stay there till the end of the timing had a really beautiful conversation powerful conversation with heart and meaning. Now we recognize we've only got three minutes till the top of the hour. So we do want to invite each of the co-creators to share briefly what unfolded or some closing thoughts. But in the meantime, knowing that some of you may have to go at the top of the hour, if you'd like to share in the chat box, what you're taking away with you, we'd, we'd love to hear that in the, in the chat box. But otherwise we're here. Um, yeah, we will, Janine and I, and um, we'll, we'll hold the room open for some yeah. time afterwards for anyone that does want to stay a little longer. So we'll, the session will not end on the hour, but we respect your time. So if you need to, to go, then the, uh, the session will close. Absolutely. So uh, I'd like to invite, um, first of all, uh, Sally to share very briefly, you know, what, what are the insights that came to you? What, is, what would you like to share from your room? I think, you know, the purpose of the group was really to have a uh, process which, you know, hopefully will move to insight. Um, but we did give that time to really name the feelings that came up in the body and uh, in other ways in response to Tim's very powerful story. And there's some very powerful feelings that got and sensations got that got named there. And um, I had a number of questions, but we only got as far as what calls me following following that. And I, again, there's a lot of process in, in responding to this because uh, it is the enormity of what's going on that came out and our way of finding that our way through the enormity and then being able to sustain our ability to keep, to keep there. The calling is strong uh, and experience is lifelong. So it takes a lot of reflection and, and stepping in and out, learning how to step in and out and work at different levels that we can answer that call at. Um, mm. yeah. 
Beautiful. Thank you, Sally. And over to you, David. What is it that you'd uh, like to do? Yeah, same thing. Two things. One, I just was prompted by what you just said, Sally, that um, I, I think um, there's a lot of beautiful things coming in. It's oh. go, go ahead, David. <laughs> uh, I thought I was being translated in real time. Um, there's a lot of beautiful things coming into our systems from the festival and I'm just wondering if we're giving ourselves enough space to actually process that and be with that and decide what actually so we don't end up like Tim and saying what I'm, and, and not doing or not being um, in the beginning of Tim's story. Um, the main thing that came out of our, our sessions that I heard anyways was this uh, wrestling with um, not just bringing climate awareness and action into coaching, but actually transforming the coaching container itself. Um, that coaching, as it's often perceived, will never be able to have the full impact it needs to in this time if we don't reimagine the entire craft and profession, which is something I've been at for probably since the beginning 25 years ago, but seems particularly urgent now. And as I checked in today too, just trying to imagine ourselves being much more creative and much more courageous to get outside our own silos, to imagine other ways of working, which is what we're gonna to need to make um, the difference we need to make. Great. Thank you, David, for sharing. Sounds like another really powerful conversation. Mm -hmm. And over to Betsy. Uh, fastest 15 minutes of my life <laughs> but um we talked actually something that came up and I hope the, the group are okay with me saying this was just the a sense of frustration about the luxury we have of being able to talk about these things when some people are just truly experiencing them whether they want to or not you know war in Ukraine people drowning in a flood that you're watching and here we are processing and I think how do we turn these frustrations into something useful in terms of how we talk about things, how we involve others and how we just do. And yeah, I'll leave it at that. I hope I've represented what we talked about in our very deep chat accurately. But yeah, it felt like it was time to take some risks and get out of our comfort zones and mm. talk less and perhaps do more. Yeah. Thank you, Betsy. And I can hear that chiming of the clock, <laughs> letting us know it's time. <laughs> time to, again, have these powerful conversations, reconnect to what is truly important, connect to, to our heart, move outside of the comfort zone and continue to, yeah, continue to create more awareness um, about what is possible and, and how we can be in these really challenging times. And so Tim, what would you like to share before we close out officially? Oh, um, well, first of all, thank you to all of you um, for co-creating this amazing field. Um, it's one of the things about the CCA and the continuum that is created in, in, in these spaces, uh, appreciating that many of you are not, I'm going to say yet, um, you know, active participants in Climate Coaching Alliance. But um, yeah, this, this, is, this is what the CCA feels like. Right? This, this, is the, this is the community um, that, that has been formed by these, drawn by the energy of these three wonderful women um, and others. So thank you all for being here. Um, I'm having quite a strong uh, embodied experience at the moment, particularly in my chest um, and my feet, uh, which tells me that I am feeling my life and wanting to do things with it, um, which is great. What I would end with is, um, yeah, I think simply an invitation to, to you know, spend some time um, reflecting and um, acknowledging the space that we all need, acknowledging the privilege that that space will give you. Um, and that if that space is not comfortable, then that probably means you are where you're meant to be. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful team. I wish you well. 
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tim, again, for really sharing that powerful story or stories, that narrative which I, I trust has touched each and every one of us um, at a really heart body laced, based level and our beautiful mind. So thank you for inspiring us to potentially be reawakened or um, identify new ways of being and doing. Um, really, truly appreciate how you're showing up so courageously. And again, a big thank you to everyone who is here today, our co-creators, our amazing co-creators who've held the space as well to support powerful conversations and for each and every one of you for showing up today so beautifully and um, and again Josie thank you <laughs> I, I, I recognize that this has been a long festival for you so thank you for being the inspirer and making this happen it really is a beautiful legacy that you have created with Eve and Alison beautiful Alison mm -hmm. um, who we know is here we trust is here so again as Tim said we are here we, we have time for those who want to perhaps ask questions, perhaps share insights. We are around. So again, thank you each and every one of you for making this a beautiful session. Thank and I you. See, uh, thanks again. And I see Stuart maybe have a question or, an, or a wave. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a wave. That's a wave. Goodbye. <laughs> thank you. Why do I feel this need to want to go to church? I don't know, Betsy, <laughs> is it the best? I've been living here for five and a half years and it still hasn't gotten me to church. I, I must have greater resistance than you, Tom. <laughs> this is Thank a you different kind of church, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> bye. Thank you, bye-bye, Karen. Thanks, Karen. Can I ask Great a question? Uh, Can I ask go. a question, Tim? Yes, Paula. Just very quickly, I don't want to take up your time, but. Um, I'm curious about what happened to you after you saw what you saw and the flood. What, what was it about that that didn't quite turn it around for you? The reason I'm asking the question is because I suppose what, one of my questions I have is, what exactly has to happen for us to wake up? And, and there you were, right in front of, you know, um, I'm, I was going to say the burning platform, but you know, the flooded valley, whatever it was, it was right there, people died right in front of you, right? And, and you went back home and what you said was nothing changed. And I'm kind of curious about what happened to you that nothing changed? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, and I just to remind you that for your own um, privacy, we're still recording the session, if that's okay. Um, if you'd prefer us to remove that um, from the record, as it were, Paula, we can do so, but I'm assuming you, we have your consent to continue and I'm happy for my response to be on the record. So um, yeah, two th well, a number of things happened, right? So first of all, this is, uh, I have now been um, informed by various people, this is what's known as vicarious trauma. Um, so not a direct threat to, to your own life and being, but you know, a, a, a proximate enough witnessing of one that you essentially sort of carry the, the trauma directly. So what is um, not uncommon is that you disassociate yourself from that experience. You essentially deny that um, you were there at a subconscious level and you do everything you can to enshrine it in a vault where it can't do you any harm as an experience right um so that that's one thing which psychologically absolutely happened um the next thing that happened was i went back to an unchanged world right so the flood was in northern africa in morocco um and everything about that environment was novel and then i got on a plane and i went back to suffolk in the uk which is lush and green and flat. And I went back to work and nothing about that world in any way related or had any contextual relevance to the experience I'd had. So there was nothing there to give me any um, 
way of processing the experience. There was the only thing I carried, and I'll answer your question, Anthony, shortly, was this, right? Um, but I buried this metaphorically in a box. I put it away. I didn't touch it for years. Um, so there was there, there was a disconnect between the place where I experienced the flood and the place that I re-immersed myself into. Um, and I won't just say the sort of the nonchalant life took over, but the return to those externalized, externally originated values, um, you know, of vanity and money and frivolity, like all of those things, you know, are comfortable, right? And, and you can, uh, yeah, you can wrap yourself up in those things very easily. Um, and the other thing that happened was when I did reach a point where I could share the experience, I started talking about it to people. Um, they had no framing for it. The friends, you know, the drinking buddies, um, you know, the other young people that I, uh, you know, was spending my time with then as a young person, like they didn't have any way of holding the space for me. So there wasn't anywhere for me to explore it. And I think a lot of the reason why my reaction to the pre-traumatic stress hallucination um, was the people that I was then with. Uh, the place is what I consider now to be the place that I'm custodian of. It is a home that my wife and I have created. Our kids are here. Uh, but it's also the fact that I'm immersed in a coaching organization. I've done a lot of internal work over the years to reassociate myself and internalize my values. Um, so it's been a long path. I don't know, to respond directly to your last question, I don't know what anyone else could do. Um, I'm not, not gonna use the word should at all, but this is my um, sort of offering, I suppose, in sharing what I am sharing. Um, that you can have an experience as powerful as that and need to just go back to what was before and put that in a box and not have it affect you. Um, and you need nurturing space and you need to be nourished with all of these um, reframing elements in order to actually connect with that experience. Um, so yeah, I don't know, I feel like I'm uh, rambling now, but I don't know if any of that's gonna be helpful to you or answers your question. And feel free to jump in anybody else that's got any perspective on this as well. I know there's some very informed people on this call, so yeah. I'd just like to jump in briefly because we have talked about this, Tim, and how I feel you're a little harsh on yourself and the way that you, you tell that, that aspect of it. Um, uh, because, you know, the context was it was the early 2000s and you yourself, nor I think anyone else at the time, connected that flash flood to climate change as uh, at there. And so for all the reasons you outlined, that was a deeply dissociative experience. And when we're dissociated, we need other people to do our thinking for us because we, we can't think things through very well. And, you know, this is why I think for us as climate communicators, uh, we need to take into account that we can be dealing with people who have either been directly traumatised or vicariously traumatised, often by the way climate um, news is, is uh, uh, managed and shared, um, to help people put their thinking together with their feeling reactions, uh, which means both creating space for the feeling reactions uh, as well as kind of normalizing resourcing. And the, and the big story about this really is what kind of resources do people need? The trauma's coming, the, you know, it was, if not already here, but what are the resources to turn that potential for awakening and post-traumatic growth 
into a reality. And I think there's a big, a big opening there for CCA uh, around that. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rose. Thank you for staying. Thank you, Rose. And um, I, I love what you shared just now, Sally. And I, uh, I also believe Anthony had a question for for you, Tim. Is that right? Yeah, Anthony, do you, do you have two minutes, or do you want to talk later? You go. Okay. So, by the gift, you're referring to the item that I was given by the elder. Um, so it's a bracelet. I believe it's made out of copper. Um, it has some in gray well kind of like it's basically been okay the camera's not really focusing on it but it's got um representations of um, mountains and sand dunes and um it's it's been sort of kind of pressed into shape and form and then it's got this black material that's been pressed into it um i haven't done any research into whether or not there's anything yeah, culturally um, you know, sort of significant about this. Um, but it's interesting to me that there's this black space in the middle. Um, and that for me is symbolic of, you know, the liminal spaces that David talks about. Um, so yeah, but happy to talk more, mate. Yeah, anytime. I'm um, sorry, Betsy, you're gonna- um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Betsy. <laughs> Amazing <laughs> seeing you. Great, great to have you here. Thanks very much. Thank you, Paula. Thanks, Phil. Really Great to see you. Story. Yeah. Irene, is there anything that you'd like to ask any of us? I want to tell you, Tim, that your story and the timeline that you described it on resonated so deeply because I've lived up here for 33 years. And in 2013, we went through a massive flood, never, ever expected. And I watched some of what you described. And then New Year's Eve, I watched the most horrific fires we've ever had. And, you know, because I'm very involved with the horse community, it involved a great deal of rescuing frightened animals and people who were roaming around in shock. And, you know, at one point I thought, I'm going to lose my mind. I've had all those years of good Jungian analysis, but I'm going to lose my mind. And one of the things I'm so grateful for is synchronistically finding this community hmm. because it has really empowered and I feel tremendous gratitude because now my work, I'm a full-time artist, is ways of witnessing. And you might be interested in Bracca Ettinger who took the word witnessing and added an H to it. So hmm. it's witnessing. And I have been using that in my work for about the past five years and it becomes very powerful. So namaste and thank you so very much and all of you for this incredible community. Thank you, thank you. Well, could, could I ask you a favor? Could you put that person's name in the chat just so that I can- um... Oh, sure. Go and follow. Oh, sure. Also, um, I'll share with you. So it's great that um, that you're working, um, you know, visually with with this. So, um, in terms of what what I'm trying to do um, with this, um, I'm working in collaboration with a painter and a poet, and the three of us are. Um, working towards forming a place-based social enterprise here to work with written, spoken and visual expressions of the experiences that people have had in this region, which are primarily with fire and also with flood um, in order to, you know, primarily what we're focusing on is community cohesion. Um, like absolutely there's an individual benefit and a, and a, and a processing you know, in, in that sort of nurturing space, but primarily like there's a lot of individual, you know, clinical and therapeutic practice. We're trying to look at the sort of the collective um, experience. Wonderful. 
Yeah. That is wonderful. And so when you say up here and assuming by your description, you're in BC or um, somewhere I'm, else on West Coast, Canada? Uh, no, no. I'm in Boulder, Colorado. Oh, Colorado. Okay. And I live at 9,000 feet in the mountains, surrounded by national forest land. Yeah, beautiful. So it's, uh, we also live with that interface of liminal space of fire danger yeah. and just listening to people and about the new ways of thinking of liminality i thought living here in the middle of a forest is living in a liminal space continuously mm. so work for me to do on my growth edge and how do i how do i continue to live here mm. you know i would never leave it but you pay a high price for the privilege yeah yeah, yeah, no. I and I will send you that right now. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, something else. I, I'm not. Um, I hope appropriating it, but there was a woman um, in the session who um, shared a, a project that she's working on in Canada. That was, uh, um, but it's not. It's not uh, intended to be just locally in Canada. Um, but essentially, they're they're um, working with um climate uh, event survivors um to work towards sharing their stories and they're trying to harness this as a network um for that kind of space so she's she's going to send me some details about what they're doing um so if you would like um i can ask if i assume it would be but i'll ask if it's okay for me to share it also with you if you would like put your email in the chat as well um and, and, and I can um, put you in touch with her um, after wonderful. she sends me that, if you'd like to, if that's interesting. Yes, anyway. wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Oh. Hi, Sue. How are you feeling, Tim? <laughs> I can't believe it's Monday morning. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I feel better. I was really um, emotional a little while ago, but I feel good now. Better now. Yeah. I, I think we we all sense that and there's been a lot of emotion on this call which has been such it's been such a privilege to share that I mean we I think everybody's been feeling a lot and experiencing a lot this morning but what an honor and a privilege to be able to be part of that and share that yeah. so thank you everybody um, who's still here and and yeah, um, thank you to those who, who have left the call too, because it was, um, my goodness, um, such a set, a, a privilege. And I, and I know, Tim, we've talked about, you know, what, what's mine to do. And one of the things I wrote down earlier was, what can I do that will make a difference? And it's just because I think sometimes we feel we need to do the big thing. And, and I was, you know, I've been thinking about your story again and, the other things that have been discussed this morning and sometimes it's it's maybe it's lots of little things but it's mm. something it's doing something and um and and i think just even if we don't quite know what that is and even asking you know doing something or asking somebody and connecting and this is why the cca i think is so important to connect with people to say well what's the what can i do and um yeah, Irene, I appreciate what you mean about living in a fire area. I also live in a very high fire risk area. and um, But it's that feeling of community that you take through each year um, and the gratitude to make it through summer each time. Um, but it's, yeah, I, I've learned so much this morning. So thank you very much for your time, everybody. And thank you for all that's gone into it today. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Really beautiful hearing that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sue. Thank you for being here. It was it was uh, oh. nice to see your face. <laughs> nice to be with with friends this time of the morning. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and again, beautiful to see you, um, Sally. And nice to meet you, Irene. And yes. Yeah. And again, Tim, beautiful, beautifully done. Thank it was thank you. Thank Tim. you for holding the space, Janine. Yeah. Likewise, beautifully it was beautiful. Done. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, both of you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Just really want to acknowledge what it takes for you, Tim, each time you tell the story and, and in such public ways. And um, yeah, and what, what an answer of the calling that is. Yeah. I don't know if you knew you could do this until you started to do what you could do. Mm. Mm. And just helping others to connect to their stories with through your story. It's interesting, you know, <clears throat> so Irene, for your reference, because everybody else here knows me quite well. Um, I started sharing this story it to more than one person at a time um, in, I'm going to say August, I should know precisely, but more or less the middle of last year. And the first few occasions were in community here. Um, so the first time was really um, was at a joint exhibition of Nicole and Bonnie, poet and painter, uh -huh. right? and they they had done a, a series of sense making pieces where they'd gone together to a place in the region, and then gone away and created their uh, written and painted piece, and then brought them together for the first time in the exhibition, and they invited just kind of open mic people to come and share stories. So I checked in with Nicole first to make sure that this would be appropriate for story and she'd heard part of it before um and yeah she she was very glad that I offered as a way of bringing sort of the the energy towards the darker pieces that they had created in bushfire impact zones um and then at a political fundraiser locally here um and then in a small CCA session, but, and then co-created co something with Sally um, for the Climate Psychology Alliance um, Summit last year. But what, what I didn't pay attention to in the early um, sharing of the story, well, a number of things I didn't pay attention to, but in particular, I didn't pay attention to the toll that, this kind of story has mm. right the toll that it has on the audience mm -hmm. and the toll that it has on me mm -hmm. um so a lot of the the sort of the um you know trauma informed um awareness raising up front has come through sally's guidance um and i delivered the speech just early in the new year as part of a sequence of climate talks um, and the one before me was very emotively triggering. And the MC, bless him, when he came to introduce the speaker after me, he was really struggling to manage his emotions and frame his words. And the speaker who came onto stage after me was in tears and took a bit of time um, to, you know, sort of gather herself. And she's a very trauma-informed person. Um, so yeah, you, you've really got to acknowledge what these kind of experiences shared can induce. Um, but it's a toll on me as well. And I'm really starting to witness that now. Um, I, the, I will keep doing this, but I need to really host myself in how and when I do that. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's not a frivolous tale. You know, and it, no, yeah. it is not. And yeah. it's, you know, thank you for, for saying that because I, I, before I left it, I did 30 years of intense trauma work in an inner city emergency room. And in those days, I'm dating myself, the only way you got through was disassociation. No one mm -hmm. recognized yeah. anything. And there was no such thing as, you know, recognized post-traumatic stress or vicarious trauma. And so it's taken me forever. And I can tell you from the other side of 60, <laughs> take very good care of yourself because it is incredibly important work and your story is very powerful. So again, thank you. Thank yeah, I, I thank you, Irene, for sharing that. And I, again, I really acknowledge your courage, Tim, to share the story, knowing that it is difficult to share, that it does bring up so much for you. And 
Um, mm. I really acknowledge the, you know, the spirit in which you share it to support others who, uh, you know, as we can potentially hear, others are experiencing something similar. So it 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 really is uh, connecting to people through hearts and minds and and bodies. So that that takes huge courage and and with it you're also inspiring and supporting people through their stories so thank you well, we can Tim, do i don't know just sorry i was going to say you don't know where that's going to take people and i know there's a cost to you but you may not know um, with, with many people who hear your story. And I hope many people have the opportunity to do that. But I don't think you'll know for many of them where it will take them. And maybe they won't know where it will take them, but it, it could be to somewhere extraordinary. Yeah. And be life-changing, not just for them, but for so many others. It's the, the ripple in the pond, you know, and you just don't yeah. know how far those ripples are going to go or, or the impact. Um, so uh, whilst I said I know that there is a cost to you, I encourage you to, to keep sharing that because um, I think the, the impact and the outcome for so many people um, is, is so important and, and can be much larger than maybe what you've even considered. Yeah, that's beautiful put. And I think, you know, I just realised, of course, that in the amplification, that bangle that you were given by the elder, Tim, has magnified into you, into your, in the sense, giving that bangle on um, every time you tell the story. And, and what a powerful act it was when he gave you that bangle and entrusted mm -hmm. you with that message. Yeah. So that unlocking, mm -hmm. it's that unlocking mm -hmm. of... Mm. those emotions that potentially many people as Irene shared have disassociated from yes. and you know even though the unlocking can be very painful it can be so incredibly powerful and life-giving <laughs> to unlock those those traumas and those emotions and to, to again the work I can hear that we're all doing is to support people to understand what those emotions, you know, what's the wisdom, what's what's the journey, what's the purpose behind those emotions that we experience. So, so thank you for sharing your bangle <laughs> with all of us. <laughs> nice, Brian. <friend. laughs> oh, I don't know about you all, but I... Uh, I'm need time for breakfast and for the grounding. <laughs> Same, same. Yeah, it's like Bye. six thirty a.m. for yeah. all of us. Apart from you, Irene, it's your Sunday evening, isn't it? So, no, it's lunchtime. Lunchtime. Oh, it's yeah. lunchtime. Oh, it's a very respectful time of day. That's very respectful. That's one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, thank you, everyone. Uh, Sally, thank you, and, everyone. and uh, thank you, Irene, for sharing. And of course, special thanks um, to Tim, Tim, and, and Janine. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely to meet you, Suzanne. Hope Great to see you, Sally. You. Bye bye. We'll and talk soon. Bye, everyone. Irene, I'll drop you a note shortly. Yeah. Wonderful. Bye. <laughs> bye.